Hello Commanders, this is Commander Oradrin again, and it is time to demonstrate how to find and kill a Thargoid Cyclops, and how to pick up the Thargoid Heart after the fight. For the purpose of this video, we start at the Spirit of Nysa megaship, currently deployed to the Colsac Nebula during the recent AX Community Goal. The first step in killing a Thargoid Interceptor is to find one. The easiest way of doing so is to enter a non-human signal source of the appropriate threat level. In a populated system, such as this one, all of the signal sources can be resolved by scanning the nav beacon. The first thing we do is therefore to lock on to the nav beacon and journey to it in supercruise. Due to some extended periods of travel, we are here going to speed up the video in the segments where nothing of interest is happening. Later on, we will also show the video in slow motion during phases that are crucial and need extra attention, such as the attack runs, where we take out the hearts of the interceptor. The speed of the video playback relative to the original recording will be displayed in the lower left corner. As I take off from the Spirit of Nysa here, I have switched on the night vision. A personal preference of mine is to enter AX combat with night vision turned on. I find that I see both the interceptor itself and the exerted hearts better this way, but you have to find out what works for you. In terms of the thruster and rotational inputs I use, please pay attention to the controller overlays in the left and right of the screen. The overlays to the left show my thruster inputs and those to the right show my rotational inputs. You should notice throughout the video how I often use maximal thruster input while the rotational inputs stay very very small. Using small rotational corrections is a key skill in Flight Assist Off in order to avoid overcorrections, which generally lead to your ship entering an uncontrollable state of rotation. In terms of pip management, we will mainly consider three different scenarios. During attack runs, we will have pips set to 024, providing the maximal recharge rate to our weapons capacitor while keeping some power to engines. In a chieftain such as this one, two pips in engines will be sufficient to keep our orbit and a full systems capacitor will allow us to pop all of our heat sinks if necessary. When an attack run is over, we are going to set pips to 141 allowing maximal power to engines while recharging our systems capacitor and also allowing the one pip to weapons to drive the thermal vent beam laser. Once the systems capacitor has been recharged, we will switch pips to 042, again providing maximal power to engines while also preparing to easily set pips to 024 for the next attack run. We will also discuss the pip management throughout the encounter. Arriving at the nav beacon, we turn to face it and scan it to resolve the unidentified signal sources, while at the same time negating our momentum so that we do not run into it. Once our frameshift drive has cooled down, we can start charging it again, while the scan completes. And when the scan completes, we can boost away from everything to gain enough speed to enter supercruise and get rid of any mass locks. As we can see, all of the signal sources are now resolved and we have discovered a large number of non-human signal sources of different threat levels. As we are looking for a Cyclops, we want to find a NHSS of threat level 5, preferably with a guaranteed solo interceptor. In the list of signal sources, a non-human signal source with three icons, including the salvage icon, is guaranteed to be populated by a single interceptor and a debris field. We therefore go through the list until we find such an NHSS with threat level 5 and set a course. While we fly towards the signal source, let us briefly look at the fire groups we will use. In fire group A, we have bound a set of one medium and one small gauze cannon to each trigger. This is done such that we can fire them with a short delay, as we will be seen later. If we fired all gauze cannons at once, our heat would spike above 20% even with an active heatsink, which would make it possible for the interceptor to get a target lock and fire at us with the main cannon. Firing the groups of gauze cannons with a slight delay allows the heatsink to dissipate the heat generated by the first set before firing off the second, which means we can keep our heat below 20% throughout the attack run. In fire group B, we have the thermal vent beam laser and the Sino scanner. 
We have here also bound the discovery scanner to the secondary trigger in the case we would need to use it in Super Cruise. This does not interfere with the use of the scanner as they are used in different modes. Finally, in via group C, we have our flak launcher for taking down the Thargon Swarm on the primary trigger, as well as our repair limpet controller on the secondary one. About to drop into the instance, we already set our fire group to fire group B, as the first thing we will do is to proceed to scan the interceptor. As we drop, we deploy our hardpoints and proceed to approach the Cyclops. As we target the Cyclops, the Xeno scanner starts performing a basic scan, which will tell us some rudimentary information about the interceptor, such as its health, shield strength and the number of remaining hearts. It will also tell us about the number of remaining Thargons in the swarm once it's deployed. The Cyclops is also interested in us and meets us to perform a scan. When coming within 500 meters distance, we start our active Xeno scan, which will reveal additional information, such as allowing us to sub-target the individual hearts and indeed confirming that we are dealing with a Cyclops. As both scans complete, the Cyclops is not particularly interested in us and turns around to examine the debris field instead. We let it build a little bit of distance and engage by tapping it briefly with our beam laser in order to not spend gauze or flak ammunition. Once engaged, we boost away from the Cyclops in order to build enough distance to take down the swarm comfortably. The Cyclops will remain stationary while deploying the swarm, so building this distance should not be a problem. We ensure that we have built sufficient distance and then turn around in order to perform the reverse key maneuver, where we fly backwards while using the flak launcher to take down the swarm. When using the flak launcher, we first aim and then press and hold the trigger, until the time when we want the flak to explode. If your aim is true, the flak will pass near the swarm, the target circle will fill and you will get audio feedback in the form of a beep, as the flak is close enough to the swarm to provide a good detonation. Note that you should not react to the beep and release when you hear it, as the flak will travel further during your reaction time, meaning that your detonation will come too late. Instead, you should try to time your flak release to the beep itself, as this will incur maximal damage to the swarm. Once the swarm is taken care of, it is time to start our first attack run, and we set our pips to 024, as discussed earlier. When the Cyclops is in range, we start firing the beam laser in order to pre-cool our ship with the thermal vent effect. At the same time, we start building transversal velocity in a direction perpendicular to the direction of the Cyclops by applying lateral and vertical thrusters and close the gap by applying forward thrust. Once our transversal velocity has built up and we are traveling towards the Cyclops, we can ease up on the throttle and start using our laterals and verticals with a bit of roll in order to create a corkscrew type of motion around the Cyclops. At the same time, we play with forward and reverse thrust in order not to make our approach too slow or indeed too fast so that we can ease ourselves into an orbit of the Cyclops. Once we are in firing range, we switch to the fire group containing our gauze cannons, pop a heatsink and start firing at the Cyclops, using staggered fire as described previously to keep our heat below 20%. After a few hits, the first heart becomes exerted, which means that we now need to aim particularly at that heart in order to destroy it. With the first heart destroyed, the Cyclops enters a lightning attack mode and starts chasing us at high speed. We therefore engage silent running and boost away with the intention of building sufficient distance for it not to catch us. We also set pips to 141 to refill the system's capacitor. Once full, we set the pips back to 042. As we have built a reasonable distance, we can now turn around to face the interceptor in reverse key while firing our beam laser to keep cool as well as chipping away on the Cyclops' freshly deployed shield. Staying cold here will be important if the interceptor comes within 3 kilometers before exiting the lightning chase mode and re-engages us with the main cannon. As the Cyclops exits the chase mode and deploys the second swarm, we boost past it to build enough distance for taking care of the swarm again. We also engage silent running in case the swarm should be fully deployed while we are still within range of the Cyclops main cannon. 
we can turn off silent running once we are again outside the 3 km range. With the Cyclops at a safe distance, we demonstrate here that you can also target the swarm by selecting it in the Contacts tab. Note how the swarm size of 32, a full Cyclops swarm, is detected by the Xeno scanner. As you proceed to flag the swarm, you can get useful feedback on how you are doing by looking at this number. In terms of aiming the flak launcher, it is not always going to be a good idea to aim directly at the leading target reticule, as the swarm will start flying in a zigzag pattern once it gets within about 3.5 km. Instead, aim at the reticule only if the swarm has just turned around. In other instances, aiming somewhere halfway between the reticule and the swarm itself usually works pretty well. Your swarm aim and prediction of the swarm's motion will improve as you gain experience. As we see here, the swarm does not always immediately vanish, although the swarm size is already down to zero. When this happens, you do not need to continue flacking, as the game will eventually catch up and the swarm will disappear. When we here target the Cyclops again, its shields are just about to drop from their natural decay and our earlier beaming. So we set pips to 0 to 4 in preparation of the attack run and start building our orbit and firing the beam laser to cool down. We build the orbit in the same manner as for the first attack run. Once in range, we switch to the Gauss fire group, pop a heatsink, exert, and take out the second heart. Unlike after the first heart, the Cyclops will here not enter a chase mode. Instead, it will enter a phase where it will try to target Lokas with caustic missiles. We can avoid this either by boosting away out of the 3km target lock zone while in silent running, or, as here, stay cold around 1km away from the Cyclops by using our thermal vent laser, which also prevents it from obtaining a target lock. We can already here switch pips to 1 for 1 to recharge the system's capacitor and start repairs and synthesis if necessary. Once the Cyclops starts deploying the next swarm, we will have bypassed the caustic missiles and proceeded to boost past the Cyclops in order to build distance for flacking down the third swarm. We again deploy silent running until we are more than 3 km away from the Cyclops to avoid any mishaps from the main cannon. With enough distance built, we again proceeded to flag down the swarm. In this instance, we will see how the swarm turns back and enter its reload phase. During this phase, it is very difficult to hit the swarm with flak, and we therefore release the current flak and wait for the swarm to re-engage us before resuming. During the reload phase, we also have time to double check the distance to the interceptor to make sure it is not getting too close. With the last Thargon down, the Cyclops' shields drops at the same time as we start firing the beam laser, and we therefore prepare an attack run by setting pips to 0 to 4 and building the orbit while using the laser to cool down. Again, when in range, switch fire group, deploy heatsink, exert, and destroy the heart. As for the previous heart, the Cyclops will not chase us after the third heart and we can again avoid this special attack by staying cold using the beam laser with pips 1 for 1 at a 1 km distance. Since it is the second to last heart, the special attack that we are currently avoiding is the shutdown field. You may also have noticed how the exert on this attack run only required one salvo of Gauss fire. This is a result of each exert requiring us to do 20% of the interceptor's current max hull in order to exert. As the maximum hull decreases as we take out the hearts, subsequent hearts will require less and less damage to exert, making exerts easier as the fight progresses. Once the next swarm deploys, we again boost past the interceptor in silent running to build enough distance to proceed with destroying the swarm. While we take down this swarm, let us note that after taking down the last heart, there will be a short window of opportunity for us to damage the Cyclops before its shields come back online. We have enough firepower to destroy the Cyclops in this time, and will therefore proceed to do so. If you fail to do so, you can repeat the same procedure as we used after hearts 2 and 3. With the swarm quickly taken care of, 
the Cyclops shield is still up. Since we have a Xeno scanner, we can see the state of its shield strength in the contacts panel to the left. Since we find that the shield is still pretty low, we prepare the attack run, with the intent that the laser will take care of the shield during the approach. So we put pips to 042, the shields go down, build the orbit, fire group, heat sink, exert, take off the heart, and finish it off before the shields come back to mind. The Cyclops has now been defeated and leaves behind a number of Thargoid materials as well as a Thargoid heart and a caustic cloud that will provide a caustic damage debuff if we fly into it. In order to pick up the heart, we therefore fly to a safe distance of just above 5 km away from the dropped materials. The Thargoid heart is useful for unlocking the Thargoid bobblehead for your cockpit if you bring it to a human tech broker along with 10 meta alloys. This is the bobblehead you can see to the right in my cockpit here. Remember that the heart is caustic and will damage your modules over time if you do not have a corrosion resistant cargo rack. Unlike the dropped materials, the heart's integrity does not decay over time. We therefore target one of the materials and use its integrity to approximate the time elapsed since the explosion and therefore when the caustic cloud will have dissipated. It is usually safe to move in once the integrity of the dropped materials have decayed to just below 50%. Once this happens, we quickly move in to scoop the heart. When scooping in FA off, it's generally easier to just look at the target image and make small adjustments with the vertical and lateral thrusters while proceeding towards whatever we are scooping. The target materials are generally useful only in some synthesis, mainly related to AX weaponry and is therefore not terribly useful, but they are for free, so here we scoop them as well. After all, they can be useful if you ever decide to do something crazy, such as fighting a basilisk solo with only AX multi-cannons. When the scooping is done, we turn night vision off and lights on to admire our handicraft before heading back to the Spirit of Nysa megaship to cash in our combat bonds. One point that should be made regarding the encounter is that while I only used a single heatsink per attack run, you will likely need to use more if your aim or firing rate is even slightly worse than the ones on display in this video. In this case, you should deploy a new heatsink as soon as the previous one is ejected. Do not wait for the heatsink deployed message from the Kovas, as this will often come rather late. Instead, look for the ejected heatsink appearing on your radar or the flashing red of the proximity lights when this happens. The Thargoid Heart is illegal cargo in all populated systems. Because of this, and because I have already unlocked the bobblehead, I here proceed to jettison the heart. Remember to avoid scans when you are carrying illicit cargo, so that you do not accumulate fines. However, someone had already taken an interest in my cargo and I had to fight an interdiction on the way back to the megaship. Once that was shaken off, we drop back to the megaship and proceed to submit a docking request. Now remember, we are running a shieldless build, so do not dock too roughly, particularly if you do not have much hull left, which may be the case after a fight with a Thargoid Interceptor.
Even if I did not take any damage in the landing here, a few stray shots from the swarm had partially damaged my hull, resulting in a small repair bill, even though the hull meter on the HUD says 100%. We rearm, repair and refuel, before entering the starport services, heading to contacts, and then the combat bond contact, where we have a 4 million credit cash reward, waiting for us for killing the cyclops, shown in this video, and another one that I had previously forgotten to cash in on. It should be said that Frontier is currently looking into the rewards for different activities in the game, so the actual combat bond that you get from the Cyclops may be different from this one. We are now ready to again fly out into the black and continue the struggle of humanity against the Thargoid threat. But this video ends here with a motto of the Antaxino Initiative, Glory to Mankind.